Um, okay, so uh, I, have, I have a wonderful title uh, of a lecture in data analytics and risk governance. Um, but my background is very different than most people in this room and uh, doesn't really deserve the title of uh, data analytics. Um, primarily, I was a philosopher, uh, a philosopher of AI and language. Um, and I taught medical ethics for uh, nearly a decade. Um, but then, in 2016, I was asked to take part in a couple of Horizon 2020 projects. And what I found there was this opportunity to bring analytical philosophy, uh, knowledge of data science, and uh, ethics into Horizon research. And it was, a, it was a wonderful thing for me because uh, it allowed me to really engage with complexity. And that's what I see as my job, really, is understanding complexity. So I'm in the Academy Business School in the Accounting and Finance Department, uh, which, again, a lot of people say, well, how, why are you in the Accounting and Finance Department? Well, there's lots of reasons for that. Uh, one, of the, one of the kind of key reasons is that what we need is auditability audit with regard to artificial intelligence and data analytics and the commercialization and business development of data uh, business models. So what I wanted to kind of really start off with say was put your hand up if you watched RT's primetime special last night on AI. Great, not many of you. <laughs> Um, I watched it. It was good. It was good fun. Uh, it was definitely fun. Now, put your hand up if you endured the three hours of the Senate committee with Sam Altman. Anyone? Oh, I did. <laughs> and uh, that was really uh, surprisingly interesting. It wasn't that hard uh, uh, a watch. I found it deeply uh, impactful in terms of, you know, it speaks a lot to my, re to my research. So, in the last couple of weeks, we've really... Um, the world has become, you know, fascinated with artificial intelligence. And I've been thinking about AI for, for a long time, and it's becoming common discourse now. And you think about, you know, how does society, how do citizens, how do ordinary people normally understand AI? Well, it's, it's through science fiction. It's through uh, social media. It's through um, TV. It's through Hollywood. And that reality, those narratives of AI are very different from the reality of AI now that we are facing. So I think it's very important that you know, shows like Primetime have kind of really focused and brought discussion and questions around AI to, to a lot of our um, uh, families and, and normal people um, who don't normally ask these questions. Now, it's very, it was a very colorful uh, depiction. But what we need is some AI realism in our life. And we need to kind of understand that how does AI, how is AI given meaning? And all of you here have a very kind of technical and, and you know, really informed uh, scientific uh, understanding of AI. And most people don't have that. But we need to kind of develop and fuel greater AI literacy. And what I want to pro propose to you today is that um, we all have to be part of that endeavor. Now, if we look at the news headlines over the last few weeks, what we find is that the godfather of AI resigned from Google, Jeffrey Hinton. We find you know, dramatic news headlines around AI, AI risk, the impact of AI, AI is going to take your jobs. The Irish Times story that um, fake AI was used to generate an article, a fake image was used for the, for the article author. ChatGPT has been dominating it. Criminals are using AI to, to scam people because now, just with a short few seconds of your voice, they can replicate your voice uh, to say anything. So, AI is definitely in our world, but there's so much misunderstanding and disorientation and confusion around what AI actually is and how it's in our world and what it means to us. And what we have to kind of really start asking is, well, how do we get AI right? How do we govern AI? How do we direct AI to social good? How do we utilize and leverage the benefits of AI? Now, this is, these are all very grand, optimistic kind of questions, but this story here where you see with the uh, Irish uh, Council of Civil Liberties uh, by Brian O'Donovan, um, that story highlights that even with the General Data Protection Regulation, um, the most robust data regulation in the world 
it's limited. There are limitations. And what we're really, and this is what I want to communicate to you today more than anything from my research, is that our current era may be one of AI innovation, AI boom, and AI growth, right? But it's also one of a new emergent challenge of AI governance. And we have moved really from a paradigm of top-down governance to a paradigm of distributed governance. And I'll get to that in a, mo in a moment or two. But this story and what Johnny Ryan states here regarding his criticism of GDPR is something that has been increasingly common. But what, it's, what, it, what it speaks to is this idea that the most robust regulation in the world, the most sophisticated data regulation in the world, is still limited. So when we think about governing AI and regulating AI, it's not going to be a magic bullet. There's not going to be any sophisticated, you know, fix-all solution here. And the one message I give to you today is that to govern and to steer AI towards social good will require the AI community to be part of that process. And I want to help you to be part of that process. So, First of all, we have to kind of find out what is AI and what is AI realism. Um, and John Norton here has been a kind of critic of, of, of a, you know, a critical uh, journalist of, around technology uh, for some time. I've kind of given up following his stories, um, but I found this one was, was really f fascinating. And it kind of speaks to my kind of research in the sense that, well, you know, is AI something impossible to stop, right? Well, it is, without a doubt. And this was in the Sam Altman uh, Senate Committee uh, yesterday. There is no stopping AI. So the Future of Life Institute um, in, in Cambridge, they created an online um, uh, signatory um, to stop, to halt, uh, to call out and halt ChatGPT for development, right? But in the Senate Committee uh, talk yesterday, you know, it was quite obvious that there's no stopping AI. This is something that is really coming into our world fast and in growing sophistication. But what we have to do and where we have an opportunity um, is to really transform how we understand AI. And this is where I think we all have a job to do. Now, the problem is, is that, and this is, this is something um, I, I wrote it, I got COVID last year. And when I had COVID, I was kind of forced uh, to stay in a room on my own for a week. Uh, and I wrote a, a chapter about the narratives of AI. Um, and what it, Dignitist research, it was kind of research I wouldn't normally do, but Dignitist research about the narratives and meaning of AI kind of made me question who determines the meaning of AI. And if we look at, at this picture here, Sam Altman, uh, Elon Musk, um, you know, AI is not about tech bros telling us what AI should be or what it means to us. AI, the use of AI in our world, in our lives, in our businesses, in our corporations, that's ultimately what will de de determine the meaning of AI. So we have to have this kind of critical self-questioning, each of us, not just industry professionals, but citizens as well. And that's something that I want to try and develop. So that's the Future of Life Institute um, uh, giant AI experiment, open AI, AI letter. I think it has about 27,000 signatories or something, yeah. Um, and what, again, I, I find these things confusing because, you know, what this really speaks to is a misunderstanding around AI and this whole kind of narrative around AGI. So Jerry was mentioned, I teach on Ireland's National AI Master's Program. Um, and every year I get, you know, someone saying to me, well, AGI is coming. Um, and I, I find this kind of disturbing stuff. But the Future of Life Institute is very much built into that kind of view of, you know, let's be worried about AGI. That's a distraction for me. I think what we need to be worried about is how AI is used to profile and uh, automate decision making in the most mundane tasks. So, and... One of the kind of striking things that has occurred, that's happened to me in the last few weeks is I have a, teen, I have a teenage daughter. And 
my daughter knows well what I do in, in my day-to-day -day job in terms of I'm always on Teams calls talking about uh, AI governance. Um, but my daughter kind of, you know, really took it uh, to be kind of delightful to come to me and say, look, I have my own AI assistant. Now, I won't go down the, the big discussion about, well, why has my uh, daughter got Snapchat? But um, she, so Snapchat introduced my AI and it allowed uh, effectively um, kids to use uh, an AI assistant. And she showed me the different kind of questions you could ask it, and you know, um, some of it was a bit clunky, some of it was a bit kind of uh, um, questionable. But one thing that kind of stuck out, and again, she came to me with this, and she said to me, look, I asked my AI, uh, and the, her peers must have been talking about this as well, I asked my AI, does it know my location? And it said no. And then she came back to me and she said, look, it suggested I go to Supermax in Cardavan, or in Limerick. So how does, it, how does it know my location? It does, right? So immediately, you know, my teenage daughter is questioning uh, the, the, the kind of the transparency and the veracity of this AI assistant that's built into her social media app that I do not want her to use. But AI is there for our children already. And that's kind of scary, right? So in, in my classes, um, what I kind of do each year, and I, when I started teaching around this about six years ago, um, I used to start off with this lovely picture and say, look, you know, it's the emergence of the data society. And we were all talking about big data 10 years ago and, um, you know, what big data offered industry and enterprise. But now we have the AI society. And this is something far more complex and something far deep, more deeply embedded. And this is where we, we urgently need to improve how we enable transparency and empower people to understand AI. So we are so lucky that we live in Ireland, that we're part of the EU. Because the EU is the global leader in AI and data governance, right? And the EU is trying, and I, I fully buy into the philosophy of the EU. I believe that it is genuinely trying to do good in terms of the governance of AI. I think it is battling pressure externally, um, but it, it is trying to do the right thing. It's trying to align AI commercialization and enterprise with core social EU values. But it needs help. And I think as a community of industry professionals working around AI and data analytics, uh, we can help it. So we need to marry academic enterprise and uh, commercial enterprise. And we can do that. And I think trustworthy AI, I used to, I, I was very critical of trustworthy AI because I was kind of doing trustworthy AI without the, the banner of trustworthy AI for years. And it was all about trying to, you know, again, merge and fuse the technical robustness with ethical robustness. And, you know, that, that's good on paper. And it's great to, you know, to talk about it. But the biggest challenge to trustworthy AI is its operationality and its scalability. So I'm not here to talk about trustworthy AI per se. What I'm here to talk about is how we can actually utilize and help EU AI governance by operationalizing trustworthy AI. And it's a kind of deeper, broader kind of frame I want to give to you because we definitely need AI to do good. We definitely need to leverage the power of AI for social good. And that means you know, addressing climate risk, addressing challenges around healthcare and, and medicine. So I see my role as a clear one is that I have a duty, and I'm you know, prepared to invest in this and to try and develop systems around supporting trustworthy AI. Now, trustworthy AI has already uh, received some critical uh, feedback, and so there's a critical literature set around trustworthy AI, and these two papers speak to that. There's questions in terms of what does trust actually mean? Who are we trusting? Are we trusting an artifact? Are we trusting an algorithm, a machine learning model? Are we trusting the people? Who, what are we trusting? Who are we trusting? So on Monday evening, I had actually the first class, Jerry, on, the, on this year's AI Masters cohort. 
And I asked them all to explain to me, you know, what they believed trustworthy eye meant. And a lot of them kind of said to me, well, you know, it's, it's vague. You know, it's, it's very, you know, vague to interpret it. So, <clears throat> so this is what I, I want to propose three things to you. Um, first is that we all know AI is complex, right? But I'm going to even make it more complex for you. Um, and the complexity of AI is not just about technical complexity, it's about social uh, and economic complexity. So we can talk about the pace, the scale, the value of AI innovation and commercialization, the promise and benefits of AI. We can talk about the complexity problem, the competition problem. So the competition problem is a massive complex issue in terms of AI development and commercialization. Because, and think of it in terms of the EU's role here, right? We have America and multinationals pushing in to the EU to try and sort of do business as usual with as little regulation as possible. Uh, and then we have China who have a completely different market at the other side. And they're, they're, both of these entities, both of these domains are really leading AI innovation. And we have the EU in the middle trying to innovate how we ought to innovate AI. And I think that's where really there's a pressure on the EU. And you know, that's why I do see my role as kind of you know, trying to contribute to this kind of research domain to understand what is the challenge of AI, not in terms of complexity, but also governance complexity. So there's three aspects to what I believe is complexity to, to AI. One is the actual technical complexity. Two is the business commercial complexity. So think about, you know, we rarely question what are the business models that actually transform a technology into a product or service. And then on top of that, we have a third layer of complexity, which is the AI governance layer, right? So complexity here is very, very uh, challenging to understand, let alone to, to actually address. And we know that there's been mistakes already. So one of the things I kind of you know, really do uh, emphasize to, to students and, and to people um, is that, and this came up in the, in the Senate committee with Sam, Sam Altman, is you know, we really have been brought on a roller coaster through social media. And big technology corporations you know, using social media and ad tech uh, as a kind of definitive, defining, uh, lucrative business model. We have really uh, f followed this uh, development over the last kind of 20 years, and we've tripped up and realized that it hasn't turned out exactly how we wanted it to turn out. There's massive kind of uh, problems with social media, the impact of social media that wasn't anticipated. And this is what worries me, actually, is that think about in in the late 90s and early noughties, right? Two lines of code of a tracking cookie built what became, what has now become the most lucrative industry of ad tech in the world. Now think of that in terms of chat GPT. You know, something innocuous, something kind of very normal, such as like a tracking cookie. What's the next unexpected development out of chat GTP? You know, so this is where we have to have a really broad, open eye on what might be passing us by as something kind of mundane, but will have huge impact in a year or two. So I did a lot of work on autonomous vehicles, and you know, again, what we learn from social media, what we learn from autonomous vehicles, is that we get caught up, we get fixated with the promise of AI, the commercialization of AI but we very rarely really engage deeply with the potential perils of AI. But, and it's, it's like, it's, here, you know, we have 100 years of innovation, right? Look at these phones. And it was, again, it was kind of funny to see on, not only the Senate committee, but on RT Primetime last night, they, both, they all used the example of the phone. Uh, so I, they kind of stole my thunder a little bit. Um, but here's a hundred years of innovation, right? With a hundred years of innovation, there's not much change. That means that regulation that was developed a hundred years ago 
still works fairly well for these, you know, cordless digital phones, right? There's not that much cha challenge or complexity in regulation because there's not much change in the actual kind of core architecture of this technology. Here we have 20 years of regulation, right? Around 20 years. Um, and I remember having, the, you know, the third one, uh, the Nokia set, handset. And I remember, you know, there was a WAP was the thing at the time, you know, uh, it was the internet on your phone and it was so terrible. Um, but with the smartphone, everything changed. I imagine you've been to presentations where, you know, this kind of same point has been made countless times. But we, again, this is an example that no one had eyes on the impact of location data, of cloud services storing your photos. And this is what we need now, is this kind of critical self-questioning awareness around AI development. So when I started researching around autonomous vehicles, one of, I think, the most important, you know, and I think original parts of my research is AI governance complexity. So Gary Marchant um, is, is famous for uh, framing this as the pacing problem, that the pace of innovation is far superior or far quicker than the pace of regulation. And, you know, it's often phrased that regulation is done by, uh, by hand, you know, whereas innovation is just unrestricted, it's just e exceeding. So we're always chasing, right? Now think of this, is that, again, going back to the GDPR, even when we do get regulation in place, that regulation can be outdated quite quickly. It might not work as well as we planned. And sometimes people suggest that bad regulation is, be is worse than no regulation. So what we've seen as a response to the pacing problem is a paradigm shift towards self-regulation. So, and I think this is where really, if we understand the complexity of, of AI governance, we will find opportunities how to govern AI better. But we have to understand that uh, complexity first. So what it means is that we, we need more transparency. We need more accountability. We need more inclusion, right? We need more uh, tools to help us make more informed decisions around the product development uh, pipeline. But the key is to understand what governance means. And this is something that I've really kind of found interesting in research is that there is a whole literature set going back to the early 90s on governance theory. And science technology studies, technology ethics have been talking about these challenges for decades. So AI governance and the challenge of, of the theoretical aspects of AI governance actually can be built on a real solid foundation of STS studies. Um, but we need to kind of really understand the ecosystem of AI governance. And again, Part of the challenge around governing AI and any kind of data-centric kind of analytics uh, commercial uh, product or service is that all of these technologies have come into play, right, in the last, let's say, two or so decades. Let's say three decades, right? In parallel to that innovation, to the complexity, to the pace of this innovation, there's also been a complete shift in governance, right? The governance has been innovated, especially in the EU. And again, <clears throat> it's, moved, it's moved from this top-down paradigm to this distributed paradigm. So these two things together have actually brought, around, brought about the challenging AI governance complexity that we now face. <clears throat> And I find this is one of the most interesting fa facets of my research, is, is people don't really appreciate these two parallels. That is two innovations interrelated that are emerge constantly evolving together. So <clears throat> self-regulation has empowered AI commercial developers, actors, to basically self-regulate. Because self-regulation 
offers some regulation, some governance value, as opposed to no governance value. So this is where trustworthy AI really comes into it, because with self-regulation, we need to trust these AI commercial developers and actors. We need to trust that the AI products and services that come into our world are developed in a trustworthy way. And to go back to this idea of an, of a, of an AI governance ecosystem in the EU, the EU will need trustworthy AI to be operationalized because the AI Act will be a part of the AI governance system. It won't be a, a complete solution, it will be a part of it. And a big part of it will be the operationality of trustworthy AI. And that's where I really want to focus in the years ahead in terms of my own research. Um, and I want to uh, use the tools that I've kind of learned to develop trustworthy AI platforms to operationalize, to support industry stakeholders, decision makers, uh, teams, professionals, and citizens to understand how to engage with, question, and work with trustworthy AI. I think my time is up, but uh, I hope um, that uh, some of that is, is, uh, is uh, uh, meaningful to you. Thank you. So, guys, uh, we just have time for uh, a few questions now. If anyone has a question for Martin, uh, there's a roving mic there. There's a question. Um, just in terms of the trustworthiness. Yeah. Um, oh, sorry, over. Uh, how do you know, so, so I've heard plenty of stories where the developers of the AI don't actually know how they came to those decisions. So like in terms of trustworthiness, how do we know that they've made the right decision based on the right data and, and stuff from the previous speaker, you know, in terms of ethics and everything, how do we know what they've done, how they've done it? Yeah, so, so a, bit, a big part of my research is focused on transparency and accountability, right? But think of data provenance as a kind of tool where we log um, throughout data pipeline what, how data changes, who's making decisions around data. We need to apply the same for AI, I think, in terms of who's making decisions, what kind of decisions they're making, but also in that log, perhaps record what they perceive as a potential risk or a potential ethical tension or question. Have that as part of that kind of you know, AI problems log. So, it, it, so primarily, we need to be, you know, focusing on empowering people to, you know, feel comfortable asking those questions and logging those questions. And it might not be that there's an answer at that time, but it might be that that starts a process towards an answer. Yeah, but if you get a false positive, then you know a false positive, then, yeah, you should be able to go back to them and say, look, <laughs> this is clearly wrong, but it's telling me it's right. So, yeah. yeah so I, I, I think there's a powerful thing here is that if we systematize it, right? if we have a system in place, um, kind of like what Rachel has done with her work, right? where we can log and record that, then suddenly we have something to appeal to. Yeah. And I think that gives it more credibility rather than having a vague discussion, oh, we must talk about this. Yeah. And do they exist now? Sorry, I'm keeping your time. <laughs> do, do they exist now? Like in the likes of ChatGPT, do you know, like, do they keep those records that they can be trawled through? And figure out those answers. I, th I think they're getting there. I know with ChatGPT they had a kind of red team you know, um, approach in the sense that they critically you know, interrogated uh, potential risks. Um, but I think it needs to be more sophisticated and more strategic in terms of you know, empowering every member of a development team uh, to just have that kind of comfortable self uh, confidence to say, look, actually, I'm concerned about this, you know, or there's, there's something to this, should we, you know, log this? You know, it's that kind of openness we need, and respect, this is something I kind of say in, in a lot of my classes when we're, we're, we're doing research together, um, is we need to be able to respect each other's voice and understanding different viewpoints, and that, I think that will empower trustworthy AI. Yeah, brilliant, thanks. Um, another one over here.
So thank you, Martin. That's a very interesting talk. Um, you mentioned yesterday that Sam Altman called for further regulation and even licensing of the US Senate Committee. Given there's already serious concerns about some of the legal implications of the data gathering techniques they've used for chat, uh, for, for GPT, how much do you think he's actually deflecting by calling for more regulation? And how engaged do you think he is and other big tech leaders in actually getting to a, a point where we have real trustworthy AI with real regulations and governance? That's a brilliant question. I, I think um, I, I'd love to spend an hour or two on that question. Um, <laughs> Okay, so I, th I think there's definitely a dramatization here, right? Um, and kind of some of the senators, you know, took Sam Altman to task and said, well, you know, you're, you're here asking us to regulate you. That's something new. You know, why are you doing that? Um, so, so, you know, there's definitely a commercial um, angle to all of this, and it's definitely a dramatization on stage. Even the Senate hearing, you know, yesterday was a dramatization, I think. But what we're seeing is... If you look through, um, let's say, some of the kind of uh, more subtle aspects of the, of, of the Senate hearing, a key point was that America wants to lead in AI governance. They want to be this leader of this global entity that it will effectively govern AI use. And so what we're seeing is the unfolding of a political dimension, a, you know, a global political dimension to AI. I don't, I don't know if that answers your question, but I think you know, it's, there's so much to it, I, and I, I think it's deeply political. Anyone? Any more? This one over here, James. Hi, uh, really enlightening talk. Um, you talked about part of the solution being self-regulation. I was wondering if you could go into a little bit more detail on, on that. Like, what does that actually look like in practice? Is it, like, solely in terms of, like, what businesses need to do? Or is it, like, including individual uh, self-regulation as well? Uh, I think you hit the nail on the head there. I think it has to be um, multi-layered in the sense that it has to start from the individual. Um, so they become almost like a regulator themselves in the sense that they have to self-regulate what they are doing in terms of design, design and development decisions, right? But it also has to come from an organization. Um, but it can't be, so lots of, we, we know through history, especially in terms of corporate social responsibility, right? Um, that the best intentions still often fail, right? Because, you know, one thing I always kind of say to, 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 to people is that whatever AI comes into the world will be through the format of a for-profit business model, right? And what that means is that there's always the priority of profitability, of revenue. And when you self-regulate, you create a tension between the internal self-regulation and the pri primary function of pursuing profit. So what we need to do in this case, and we've seen with Boeing, right, and, and the 737 MAX, there was a push and allowance to self-regulate more right? And it can have disastrous consequences. So how do we make self-regulation work better? And this is where we need something like what we have with ESG. We need disclosure. And I'm working, I've actually got uh, a couple of projects um, under review for funding. And one of those projects is all about trying to operationalize trustworthy AI in such a way that it builds upon corporations have AI disclosures that we can quantify into a trustworthy AI rating. So self-regulation is the key, right? We need self-regulation, but we need better self-regulation. Okay. Thank you. One down the back, James. All right, we should. Uh, thanks for the great talk. Um, I'm uh, Ed Curry from the Insight Center for Data Analytics. And we do a lot of work with the Commission as well in the European Partnership on AI Data and Robotics, specifically actually looking at trust labels for AI products and services. So to try to get more transparency about what's actually happening internally. But I, I think it's interesting to connect, to connect your talk to, to Rachel's talk before this, where, where Rachel gave the, the GDPR example. If you want to stop a data project, ask a question about GDPR. And there's a pause, because we need to think and reflect. And, and I wonder, while, while I fully agree that we need to have 
AI regulation. When we look at the global context, we have a competition between China and the US for AI dominance. Europe isn't even a player in that today. And I do fear that while the AI Act, I think, is innovative, could it actually prevent AI innovations from taking place in Europe through the GDPR-like question, but this time for AI? So are, are we too far ahead of the game, and do we need to possibly let more innovation take place before we try to put, in, put, put regulation in place? It, it, the example would be like talking to Marconi or Alexander Graham Bell about regulating telecoms companies. You know, are, are we too soon with this, and do we potentially hurt European interests by doing this too early? Okay, great, great question. Um, so, the AI Act, my personal opinion on the AI Act, AI Act is it's watered down already, right? So, a key kind of criteria in the AI Act is that unless it's social, personal fo uh, focused AI applications, it, it's kind of, they, 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 they don't want to regulate it. So, if it's an industrial application um, in terms of imp using AI to optimize some product flow, uh, that doesn't involve personal data or sensitive data, then it's, it's not regulated. So the risk-informed uh, you know, foundation to the AI Act is actually going to give uh, a great deal of openness to AI innovation, I think. And that's why you know, the point I make here is that the AI Act will only go so far in terms of regulating and governing AI. What we need is something uh, more agile, more bottom-up, and that's where trustworthy... So, so trustworthy AI, as I, as I said, I started off very critical of it. I now see my position as needing to support it, to support the operationality and the scalability of it. And that's why I think if we use um, the benefits of technology that's available to us to operationalize trustworthy AI better, then we can kind of you know, support uh, the, the wider AI governance ecosystem in the EU and make EU, the EU market. It's a very lucrative market, so everyone wants a piece of it. But we can make it a more competitive market in terms of AI innovation by having that kind of multi-layered, dynamic AI governance ecosystem. Yeah, thanks. I think that's okay. all the questions we have time for. Thanks again to Martin for a great talk. Thank you very much. We'll now have a break and we'll see you back here in about 15 minutes.